This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. How to Speak and Write Correctly by Joseph Devlin. Chapter 11 Slang. Origin American Slang, Foreign Slang. Slang is more or less common in nearly all ranks of society, and in every walk of life at the present day. Slang words and expressions have crept into our everyday language, and so insidiously that they have not been detected by the great majority of speakers, and so have become part and parcel of their vocabulary on an equal footing with the legitimate words of speech. They are called upon to do similar service as the ordinary words used in everyday conversation to express thoughts and desires, and convey meaning from one to another. In fact, in some cases, slang has become so useful that it has far outstripped classic speech and made for itself such a position in the vernacular that it would be very hard in some cases to get along without it. Slang words have usurped the place of regular words of language in very many instances, and reign supreme in their own strength and influence. Cant and slang are often confused in the popular mind, yet they are not synonymous, though very closely allied, and proceeding from a common gypsy origin. Cant is the language of a certain class, the peculiar phraseology or dialect of a certain craft, trade, or profession, and is not readily understood save by the initiated of such craft, trade, or profession. It may be correct according to the rules of grammar, but it is not universal. It is confined to certain parts and localities, and is only intelligible to those for whom it is intended. In short, it is an esoteric language which only the initiated can understand. The jargon or patter of thieves is cant, and is only understood by thieves who have been let into its significance. The initiated language of professional gamblers is cant, and is only intelligible to gamblers. On the other hand, Slang, as it is nowadays, belongs to no particular class, but is scattered all over, and gets entree into every kind of society, and is understood by all where it passes current in everyday expression. Of course, the nature of slang, to a great extent, depends upon the locality, as it chiefly is concerned with colloquialisms, or words and phrases common to a particular section. For instance, the slang of London is slightly different from that of New York and some words in the one city may be unintelligible in the other, though well understood in that which they are current. Nevertheless, slang may be said to be universally understood. To kick the bucket, to cross the Jordan, to hop the twig, are just as expressive of the departing from life in the backwoods of America or the wilds of Australia as they are in London or Dublin. Slang simply consists of words and phrases which pass current but are not refined, nor elegant enough to be admitted into polite speech or literature, whenever they are recognized as such. But, as has been said, a great many use slang without their knowing it as slang, and incorporate it into their everyday speech and conversation. Some authors purposely use slang to give emphasis and spice in familiar and humorous writing, but they should not be imitated by the tyro. A master such as Dickens is forgivable, but in the novice it is unpardonable. There are several kinds of slang attached to different professions and classes of society. For instance, there is college slang, political slang, sporting slang, etc. It is the nature of slang to circulate freely among all classes. Yet there are several kinds of this current form of language corresponding to the several classes of society. The two great divisions of slang are the vulgar of the uneducated and coarse-minded, and the high-toned slang of the so-called upper classes, the educated and the wealthy. The hoyden of the gutter does not use the same slang as my lady in her boudoir, but both use it, and so expressive is it that the one might readily understand the other if brought in contact. Therefore, there are what may be styled an ignorant slang and an educated slang, the one common to the purlieus and the alleys, the other to the parlour and the drawing-room. In all cases, the object of slang is to express an idea in a more vigorous, piquant, and terse manner than standard usage ordinarily admits. 
a schoolgirl, when she wants to praise a baby, exclaims, "'Oh, isn't he awfully cute!' To say that he is very nice would be too weak a way to express her admiration. When a handsome girl appears on the street, an enthusiastic masculine admirer, to express his appreciation of her beauty, tells you, "'She is a peach, a bird, a cuckoo,' any of which accentuates his estimation of the young lady, and is much more emphatic than saying, "'She is a beautiful girl, a handsome maiden, or a lovely young woman.'" When a politician defeats his rival, he will tell you, "'It was a cinch. He had a walk-over, to impress you how easy it was to gain victory.'" Some slang expressions are of the nature of metaphors and are highly figurative. Such are, to pass in your checks, to hold up, to pull the wool over your eyes, to talk through your hat, to fire out, to go back on, to make yourself solid with, to have a jag on, to be loaded, to freeze on to, to bark up the wrong tree, don't monkey with the buzz-saw, and in the soup. Most slang had a bad origin. The greater part originated in the cant of thieves' Latin, but it broke away from this cant of malefactors in time, and gradually evolved itself from its unsavory past, until it developed into a current form of expressive speech. Some slang, however, can trace its origin back to very respectable sources. Stolen fruits are sweet, may be traced to the Bible in sentiment. Proverbs 9.17 has it, Stolen waters are sweet. What are you giving me, supposed to be a thorough Americanism, is based upon Genesis 38.16. The common slang, a bad man, in referring to Western desperadoes, in almost the identical sense now used, is found in Spencer's Fairy Queen, Massinger's play A New Way to Pay Old Debts, and in Shakespeare's King Henry VIII. The expression, to blow on, meaning to inform, is in Shakespeare's As You Like It. It's all Greek to me is traceable to the play of Julius Caesar. All cry and no wool is in Butler's Hudibras. Pious frauds, meaning hypocrites, is from the same source. Too thin, referring to an excuse, is from Smollett's Peregrine Pickle. Shakespeare also used it. America has had a large share in contributing to modern slang. The heathen chiny and ways that are dark and tricks that are vain are from Bret Hart's truthful James. Not for Joe, arose during the Civil War, when one soldier refused to give a drink to another. Not if I know myself, had its origin in Chicago. What's the matter with blank? He's all right. Had its beginning in Chicago also, and first was, "'What's the matter with Hannah?' referring to a lazy domestic servant. "'There's millions in it, and, by a large majority, came from Mark Twain's Gilded Age. "'Pull down your vest, Jim Jams, got em bad. "'That's what's the matter. Go hire a hall. Take in your sign. Dry up. Hump yourself. It's the man around the corner. Putting up a job. Put a head on him.' No back talk, bottom dollar, went off on his ear, chalk it down, staving him off, making it warm, dropping him gently, dead gone, busted, counter jump, put up or shut up, bang up, smart aleck, too much jaw, chin music, top heavy, barefooted on the top of the head, a little too fresh, champion liar, chief cook and bottle washer bag and baggage, as fine as silk, name your poison, died with his boots on, old hoss, hunky-dory, hold your horses, galoot, and many others in use at present are all Americanisms in slang. California especially has been most fecund in this class of figurative language. To this state we owe, go off and die, don't you forget it, rough deal, square deal, flush times, pool your issues, go bury yourself, go drown yourself, give your tongue a vacation, a bad egg, go climb a tree, plug hats, dolly vardens, well fixed, down to bedrock, hardpan, 
Pay dirt. Petered out. It won't wash. Slug of whiskey. It pans out well. And I should smile. Small potatoes and a few in the hill. Soft snap. All fired. Gold dernet. An uphill job. Slick. Shortcut. Guess not. Correct thing. Are Bostonisms. The terms innocent. Acknowledge the corn. Bark up the wrong tree. Great snakes. I reckon. Playing possum. Dead shot. Had their origins in the southern states. Doggone it. That beats the Dutch. You bet. You bet your boots. Sprang from New York. Step down and out. Originated in the Beecher trial. Just as brainstorm originated in the Thaw trial. Among the slang phrases that have come directly to us from England may be mentioned throw up the sponge, draw it mild, give us a rest, deadbeat, on the shelf, up the spout, stunning, gift of the gab, etc. The newspapers are responsible for a large part of the slang. Reporters, staff writers, and even editors put words and phrases into the mouths of individuals which they never utter. New York is supposed to be the headquarters of slang, particularly that portion of it known as the Bowery. All transgressions and corruptions of language are supposed to originate in that unclassic section, while the truth is that the laws of polite English are as much violated on Fifth Avenue. Of course, the foreign element mincing their pigeon English have given the Bowery an unenviable reputation, but there are just as good speakers of the vernacular on the Bowery as elsewhere in the greater city. Yet every inexperienced newspaper reporter thinks that it is incumbent on him to hold the Bowery up to ridicule and laughter, so he sits down, and out of his circumscribed brain mutilates the English tongue, he can rarely coin a word, and blames the mutilation on the Bowery. Tis the same with newspapers and authors, too, detracting the Irish race. Men and women who have never seen the green hills of Ireland paint Irish characters as boors and blunderers, and make them say ludicrous things, and use such language as is never heard within the four walls of Ireland. Tis very well known that Ireland is the most learned country on the face of the earth, is, and has been. The schoolmaster has been abroad there for hundreds, almost thousands of years, and nowhere else in the world to-day is the King's English spoken so purely as in the cities and towns of the little western isle. Current events, happenings of everyday life, often give rise to slang words, and these, after a time, come into such general use that they take their places in everyday speech like ordinary words, and, as has been said, their users forget that they were once slang. For instance, the days of the Land League in Ireland originated the word boycott, which was the name of a very unpopular landlord, Captain Boycott. The people refused to work for him, and his crops rotted on the ground. From this time, any one who came into disfavour, and whom his neighbours refused to assist in any way, was said to be boycotted. Therefore, to boycott means to punish by abandoning or depriving a person of the assistance of others. At first it was a notoriously slang word, but now it is standard in the English dictionaries. Politics add to our slang words and phrases. From this source we get dark horse, the grey mare is the better horse, barrel of money, buncombe, gerrymander, scalawag, henchman, log rolling, pulling the wires, taking the stump, machine, slate etc. The money market furnishes us with corner, bull, bear, lamb, slump, and several others. The custom of the times and the requirements of current expression require the best of us to use slang words and phrases on occasion. Often we do not know they are slang, just as a child often uses profane words without consciousness of their being so. We should avoid the use of slang as much as possible, even when it serves to convey our ideas in a forceful manner, and when it has not gained a firm foothold in current speech, it should be used not at all. 
remember that most all slang is of vulgar origin, and bears upon its face the bend sinister of vulgarity. Of the slang that is of good birth, pass it by if you can, for it is like a broken-down gentleman, of little good to any one. Imitate the great masters as much as you will in classical literature, but when it comes to their slang, draw the line. Dean Swift, the great Irish satirist, coined the word fizz for face. Don't imitate him. If you are speaking or writing of the beauty of a lady's face, don't call it her fizz. The dean, as an intellectual giant, had a license to do so. You haven't. Shakespeare used the word flush to indicate plenty of money. Well, just remember there was only one Shakespeare, and he was the only one that had a right to use that word in that sense. You'll never be a Shakespeare. There will never be such another. Nature exhausted herself in producing him. Bulwer used the word stretch for hang, as to stretch his neck. Don't follow his example in such use of the word. Above all, avoid the low, coarse, vulgar slang, which is made to pass for wit among the riff-raff of the street. If you are speaking or writing of a person, having died last night, don't say or write, he hopped the twig, or he kicked the bucket. If you are compelled to listen to a person discoursing on a subject of which he knows little or nothing, don't say, he is talking through his hat. If you are telling of having shaken hands with Mr. Roosevelt, don't say, he tipped me his flipper. If you are speaking of a wealthy man, don't say, he has plenty of spondulix, or the long green. All such slang is low, coarse, and vulgar, and is to be frowned upon on any and every occasion. If you use slang, use the refined kind, and use it like a gentleman, that it will not hurt or give offence to any one. Cardinal Newman defined a gentleman as he who never inflicts pain. Be a gentleman in your slang. Never inflict pain. End of chapter 11「This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Andrew Lebrun, Boston, Massachusetts. How to Speak and Write Correctly by Joseph Devlin. Chapter 12. Writing for Newspapers. Qualification. Appropriate Subjects. Directions. The newspaper nowadays goes into every home in the land. What was formerly regarded as a luxury is now looked upon as a necessity. No matter how poor the individual, he is not too poor to afford a penny to learn not only what is taking place around him in his own immediate vicinity, but also what is happening in every quarter of the globe. The laborer on the street can be as well posted on the news of the day as the banker in his office. Through the newspaper he can feel the pulse of the country, and find whether its vitality is increasing or diminishing. He can read the signs of the times, and scan the political horizon for what concerns his own interests. The doings of foreign countries are spread before him, and he can see at a glance the occurrences in the remotest corners of the earth. If a fire occurred in London last night, he can read about it at his breakfast table in New York this morning and probably get a better account than the Londoners themselves. If a duel takes place in Paris, he can read all about it, even before the contestants have left the field. There are upwards of 3,000 daily newspapers in the United States, more than 2,000 of which are published in towns containing less than 100,000 inhabitants. In fact, many places of less than 10,000 population can boast the publishing of a daily newspaper. There are more than 15,000 weeklies published. Some of the so-called country papers wield quite an influence in their localities, and even outside, and are money-making agencies for their owners and those connected with them, both by way of circulation and advertisements. It is surprising the number of people in this country who make a living in the newspaper field. 
Apart from the regular toilers, there are thousands of men and women who make newspaper work a side issue, who add tiny sums of pin money to their incomes by occasional contributions to the daily, weekly, and monthly press. Most of these people are only persons of ordinary, everyday ability, having just enough education to express themselves intelligently in writing. It is a mistake to imagine, as so many do, that an extended education is necessary for newspaper work. Not at all. On the contrary, in some cases, a high-class education is a hindrance, not a help, in this direction. The general newspaper does not want learned disquisitions nor philosophical theses. As its name implies, it wants news, current news, interesting news, something to appeal to its readers, to arouse them and rivet their attention. In this respect, very often a boy can write a better article than a college professor. The professor would be apt to use words beyond the capacity of most of the readers, while the boy, not knowing such words, would probably simply tell what he saw, how great the damage was, who were killed or injured, etc., and use language which all would understand. Of course, there are some brilliant scholars, deeply read men and women in the newspaper realm, but, on the whole, those who have made the greatest names commenced ignorant enough, and most of them graduated by way of the country paper. Some of the leading writers of England and America at the present time started their literary careers by contributing to the rural press. They perfected and polished themselves as they went along until they were able to make names for themselves in universal literature. If you want to contribute to newspapers or enter the newspaper field as a means of livelihood, don't let lack of a college or university education stand in your way. As has been said elsewhere in this book, some of the greatest masters of English literature were men who had but little advantage in the way of book learning. Shakespeare, Bunyan, Burns, and scores of others, who have left their names indelibly inscribed on the tablets of fame, had little to boast in the way of book education, but they had what is popularly known as horse sense, and a good working knowledge of the world. In other words, they understood human nature, and were natural themselves. Shakespeare understood mankind because he was himself a man. Hence, he has portrayed the feelings, the emotions, the passions with a master's touch, delineating the king in his place as true to nature as he has done the peasant in his hut. The monitor within his own breast gave him warning as to what was right and what was wrong, just as the daemon ever by the side of old Socrates whispered in his ear the course to pursue under any and all circumstances. Burns, guiding the plough, conceived thoughts, and clothed them in a language which has never, nor probably ever will be, surpassed by all the learning which art can confer. These men were natural, and it was the perfection of this naturality that wreathed their brows with the never-fading laurels of undying fame. If you would essay to write for the newspaper, you must be natural, and express yourself in your accustomed way without putting on airs or frills. You must not ape ornaments and indulge in bombast or rodomantade, which stamp a writer as not only superficial, but silly. There is no room for such in the everyday newspaper. It wants facts stated in plain, unvarnished, unadorned language. True, you should read the best authors and, as far as possible, imitate their style but don't try to literally copy them. Be yourself on every occasion, no one else. Not like Homer would I write, not like Dante if I might, not like Shakespeare at his best, not like Goethe or the rest, like myself, however small, like myself or not at all. Put yourself in the place of the reader, and write what will interest yourself, and in such a way that your language will appeal to your own ideas of the fitness of things. You belong to the great commonplace majority. Therefore, don't forget that in writing for the newspapers, you are writing for that majority, and not for the learned and aesthetic minority. Remember, you are writing for the man on the street and in the streetcar. 
You want to interest him, to compel him to read what you have to say. He does not want a display of learning. He wants news about something which concerns himself, and you must tell it to him in a plain, simple manner, just as you would do if you were face to face with him. What can you write about? Why, about anything that will constitute current news, some leading event of the day, anything that will appeal to the readers of the paper to which you wish to submit it. No matter in what locality you may live, however backward it may be, you can always find something of genuine human interest to others. If there is no news happening, write of something that appeals to yourself. We are all constituted alike, and the chances are that what will interest you will interest others. Descriptions of adventure are generally acceptable. Tell of a fox hunt, or a badger hunt, or a bear chase. If there is any important manufacturing plant in your neighborhood, describe it, and, if possible, get photographs, for photography plays a very important part in the news items of today. If a great man lives near you, one whose name is on the tip of every tongue, go and get an interview with him, obtain his views on the public questions of the day, describe his home life and his surroundings, and how he spends his time. Try and strike something germane to the moment, something that stands out prominently in the limelight of the passing show. If a noted personage, some famous man or woman, is visiting the country, it is a good time to write up the place from which he or she comes, and the record he or she has made there. For instance, it was opportune to write of Sulu and the little Pacific archipelago during the Sultan's trip through the country. If an attempt is made to blow up an American battleship, say, in the harbor of Appia in Samoa, it affords a chance to write about Samoa and Robert Louis Stevenson. When Manuel was hurled from the throne of Portugal, it was a ripe time to write of Portugal and Portuguese affairs. If any great occurrence is taking place in a foreign country, such as the crowning of a king or the dethronement of a monarch, it is a good time to write up the history of the country and describe the events leading up to the main issue. When a particularly savage outbreak occurs amongst wild tribes in the dependencies, such as a rising of the Manobos in the Philippines, it is opportune to write of such tribes and their surroundings, and the causes leading up to the revolt. Be constantly on the lookout for something that will suit the passing hour. Read the daily papers, and probably in some obscure corner you may find something that will serve you as a foundation for a good article something, at least, that will give you a clue. Be circumspect in your selection of a paper to which to submit your copy. Know the tone and general import of the paper, its social leanings and political affiliations, also its religious sentiments, and, in fact, all the particulars you can regarding it. It would be injudicious for you to send an article on a prize fight to a religious paper, or, vice versa, an account of a church meeting, to the editor of a sporting sheet. If you get your copy back, don't be disappointed, nor yet disheartened. Perseverance counts more in the newspaper field than anywhere else, and only perseverance wins in the long run. You must become resilient. If you are pressed down, spring up again. No matter how many rebuffs you may receive, do not be discouraged, but call fresh energy to your assistance, and make another stand. If the right stuff is in you, it is sure to be discovered. Your light will not remain long hidden under a bushel in the newspaper domain. If you can deliver the goods, editors will soon be begging you instead of your begging them. Those men are constantly on the lookout for persons who can make good. Once you get into print, the battle is won, for it will be an incentive to you to persevere and improve yourself at every turn. Go over everything you write, cut and slash and prune, until you get it into as perfect form as possible. Eliminate every superfluous word, and be careful to strike out all ambiguous expressions and references. If you are writing for a weekly paper, remember it differs from a daily one. Weeklies want what will not alone interest the man on the street, but the woman at the fireside. They want out-of-the-way facts curious scraps of lore, 
personal notes of famous or eccentric people, reminiscences of exciting experiences, interesting gleanings in life's numberless byways, in short, anything that will entertain, amuse, instruct the home circle. There is always something occurring in your immediate surroundings, some curious event or thrilling episode that will furnish you with the data for an article. You must know the nature of the weekly to which you submit your copy, the same as you must know the daily. For instance, the Christian Herald, while avowedly a religious weekly, treats such secular matters as makes the paper appeal to all. On its religious side, it is non-sectarian, covering the broad field of Christianity throughout the world. On its secular side, it deals with human events in such an impartial way that everyone, no matter to what class they may belong or to what creed they may subscribe, can take a living personal interest. The monthlies offer another attractive field for the literary aspirant. Here, again, don't think that you must be a university professor to write for a monthly magazine. Many, indeed most, of the foremost magazine contributors are men and women who have never passed through a college, except by going in at the front door and emerging from the back one. However, for the most part, they are individuals of wide experience, who know the practical side of life, as distinguished from the theoretical. The ordinary monthly magazine treats of the leading questions and issues which are engaging the attention of the world for the moment, great inventions, great discoveries, whatever is engrossing the popular mind for the time being, such as flying machines, battleships, skyscrapers, the opening of mines, the development of new lands, political issues, views of party leaders, character sketches of distinguished personages, etc. However, before trying your skill for a monthly magazine, it would be well for you to have a good apprenticeship in writing for the daily press. Above all things, remember that perseverance is the key that opens the door of success. Persevere! If you are turned down, don't get disheartened. On the contrary, let the rebuff act as a stimulant to further effort. Many of the most successful writers of our time have been turned down again and again. For days and months, even years, some of them have hawked their wares from one literary door to another until they found a purchaser. You may be a great writer in embryo, but you will never develop into a fetus, not to speak of full maturity, unless you bring out what is in you. Give yourself a chance to grow, and seize upon everything that will enlarge the scope of your horizon. Keep your eyes wide open, and there is not a moment of the day in which you will not see something to interest you, and in which you may be able to interest others. Learn, too, how to read nature's book. There's a lesson in everything, in the stones, the grass, the trees, the babbling brooks, and the singing birds. Interpret the lesson for yourself, then teach it to others. Always be in earnest in your writing. Go about it in a determined kind of way. Don't be faint-hearted or backward. Be brave. Be brave, and evermore be brave. On the wide, tented field in the battle of life, with an army of millions before you, like a hero of old, gird your soul for the strife, and let not the foeman tramp o'er you. Act, act like a soldier, and proudly rush on, the most valiant in bravery's van. With keen flashing sword, cut your way to the front, and show to the world you're a man. If you are of the masculine gender, be a man in all things, in the highest and best acceptation of the word. That is the noblest title you can boast, higher far than that of earl or duke, emperor or king. In the same way, womanhood is the grandest crown the feminine head can wear. When the world frowns on you, and everything seems to go wrong, possess your soul in patience, and hope for the dawn of a brighter day. It will come. The sun is always shining behind the darkest clouds. When you get your manuscripts back, again and again, don't despair, nor think the editor cruel and unkind. He too has troubles of his own. Keep up your spirits until you have made the final test and put your talents to a last analysis. Then, if you find you cannot get into print, 
be sure that newspaper writing or literary work is not your forte and turn to something else if nothing better presents itself try shoemaking or digging ditches remember honest labor no matter how humble is ever dignified if you are a woman throw aside the pen sit down and darn your brother's your father's or your husband's socks or put on a calico apron take soap and water and scrub the floor no matter who you are do something useful that old sophistry about the world owing you a living has been exploded long ago the world does not owe you a living but you owe it servitude and if you do not pay the debt you are not serving the purpose of an all-wise providence and filling the place for which you were created it is for you to serve the world to make it better brighter higher holier grander nobler richer for your having lived in it this you can do in no matter what position fortune has cast you whether it be that of street laborer or president fight the good fight and gain the victory above all to thine own self be true and twill follow as the night the day thou canst not then be false to any man End of chapter twelve writing for newspapers This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Kara Schallenberg. How to Speak and Write Correctly by Joseph Devlin. Chapter 13 Choice of Words. Small Words. Their Importance. The Anglo Saxon Element. In another place in this book, advice has been given to never use a long word when a short one will serve the same purpose. This advice is to be emphasized. Words of learned length and thundering sound should be avoided on all possible occasions. They proclaim shallowness of intellect and vanity of mind. The great purists, the masters of diction, the exemplars of style, used short, simple words that all could understand, words about which there could be no ambiguity as to meaning. It must be remembered that by our words we teach others. Therefore a very great responsibility rests upon us in regard to the use of a right language. We must take care that we think and speak in a way so clear that there may be no misapprehension or danger of conveying wrong impressions by vague and misty ideas enunciated in terms which are liable to be misunderstood by those whom we address. Words give a body or form to our ideas, without which they are apt to be so foggy that we do not see where they are weak or false. We must make the endeavor to employ such words as will put the idea we have in our own mind into the mind of another. This is the greatest art in the world, to clothe our ideas in words clear and comprehensive to the intelligence of others. It is the art which the teacher, the minister, the lawyer, the orator, the business man must master if they would command success in their various fields of endeavor. It is very hard to convey an idea to, and impress it on, another, when he has but a faint conception of the language in which the idea is expressed, but it is impossible to convey it at all when the words in which it is clothed are unintelligible to the listener. If we address an audience of ordinary men and women in the English language, but use such words as they cannot comprehend, we might as well speak to them in Coptic or Chinese, for they will derive no benefit from our address, inasmuch as the ideas we wish to convey are expressed in words which communicate no intelligent meaning to their minds. Long words, learned words, words directly derived from other languages, are only understood by those who have had the advantages of an extended education. All have not had such advantages. The great majority in this grand and glorious country of ours have to hustle for a living from an early age. Though education is free, and compulsory also, 
very many never get further than the three R's. These are the men with whom we have to deal most in the arena of life, the men with the horny palms and the iron muscles, the men who build our houses, construct our railroads, drive our street-cars and trains, till our fields, harvest our crops. In a word, the men who form the foundation of all society, the men on whom the world depends to make its wheels go round. The language of the colleges and universities is not for them, and they can get along very well without it. They have no need for it at all in their respective callings. The plain, simple words of everyday life, to which the common people have been used around their own firesides from childhood, are the words we must use in our dealings with them. Such words are understood by them, and understood by the learned as well. Why, then, not use them universally, and all the time? Why make a one-sided affair of language by using words which only one class of the people, the so-called learned class, can understand? Would it not be better to use, on all occasions, language which the both classes can understand? If we take the trouble to investigate, we shall find that the men who exerted the greatest sway over the masses, and the multitude as orators, lawyers, preachers, and in other public capacities, were men who used very simple language. Daniel Webster was among the greatest orators this country has produced. He touched the hearts of senates and assemblages, of men and women, with the burning eloquence of his words. He never used a long word when he could convey the same or nearly the same meaning with a short one. When he made a speech he always told those who put it in form for the press to strike out every long word. Study his speeches, go over all he ever said or wrote, and you will find that his language was always made up of short, clear, strong terms, although at times, for the sake of sound and oratorical effect, he was compelled to use a rather long word, but it was always against his inclination to do so, and where was the man who could paint with words, as Webster painted. He could picture things in a way so clear that those who heard him felt that they had seen that of which he spoke. Abraham Lincoln was another who stirred the souls of men, yet he was not an orator, not a scholar. He did not write M.A. or Ph.D. after his name, or any other college degree, for he had none. He graduated from the University of Hard Knocks, and he never forgot this severe alma mater when he became President of the United States. He was just as plain, just as humble, as in the days when he split rails or plied a boat on the Sangamon. He did not use big words, but he used the words of the people, and in such a way as to make them beautiful. His Gettysburg Address is an English classic, one of the great masterpieces of the language. From the mere fact that a word is short, it does not follow that it is always clear. But it is true that nearly all clear words are short, and that most of the long words, especially those which we get from other languages, are misunderstood to a great extent by the ordinary rank and file of the people. Indeed, it is to be doubted if some of the scholars using them fully understand their import on occasions. A great many such words admit of several interpretations. A word has to be in use a great deal before people get thoroughly familiar with its meaning. Long words not alone obscure thought and make the ideas hazy, but at times they tend to mix up things in such a way that positively harmful results follow from their use. For instance, Crime can be so covered with the folds of long words as to give it a different appearance. Even the hideousness of sin can be cloaked with such words until its outlines look like a thing of beauty. When a bank cashier makes off with a hundred thousand dollars, we politely term his crime defalcation instead of plain theft, and instead of calling himself a thief, we grandiosely allude to him as a defaulter. When we see a wealthy man staggering along a fashionable thoroughfare under the influence of alcohol, waving his arms in the air and shouting boisterously, we smile and say, Poor gentleman, he is somewhat exhilarated. 
or at worst we say, he is slightly inebriated. But when we see a poor man who has fallen from grace by putting an enemy into his mouth to steal away his brain, we express our indignation in the simple language of the words, Look at the wretch, he is dead drunk. When we find a person in downright lying, we cover the falsehood with the finely spun cloak of the word prevarication. Shakespeare says, A rose by any other name would smell as sweet, and by a similar sequence a lie, no matter by what name you may call it, is always a lie, and should be condemned. Then why not simply call it a lie? Mean what you say, and say what you mean. Call a spade a spade. It is the best term you can apply to the implement. When you try to use short words, and shun long ones, in a little while you will find that you can do so with ease. A farmer was showing a horse to a city-bred gentleman. The animal was led into a paddock in which an old sow-pig was rooting. "'What a fine quadruped!' exclaimed the city-man. "'Which of the two do you mean, the pig or the horse?' queried the farmer. "'For, in my opinion, both of them are fine quadrupeds.' Of course the visitor meant the horse, so it would have been much better had he called the animal by its simple, ordinary name. There would have been no room for ambiguity in his remark. He profited, however, by the incident, and never called a horse a quadruped again. Most of the small words, the simple words, the beautiful words, which express so much within small bounds, belong to the pure Anglo-Saxon element of our language. This element has given names to the heavenly bodies, the sun, moon, and stars, to three out of the four elements, earth, fire, and water, three out of the four seasons, spring, summer, and winter. Its simple words are applied to all the natural divisions of time, except one, as day, night, morning, evening, twilight, noon, midday, midnight, sunrise, and sunset. The names of light, heat, cold, frost, rain, snow, hail, sleet, thunder, lightning, as well as almost all those objects which form the component parts of the beautiful, as expressed in external scenery, such as sea and land, hill and dale, wood and stream, etc., are Anglo-Saxon. To this same language we are indebted for those words which express the earliest and dearest connections, and the strongest and most powerful feelings of nature, and which, as a consequence, are interwoven with the fondest and most hallowed associations. Of such words are father, mother, husband, wife, brother, sister, son, daughter, child, home, kindred, friend, hearth, roof, and fireside. The chief emotions of which we are susceptible are expressed in the same language. Love, hope, fear, sorrow, shame, and also the outward signs by which these emotions are indicated, as tear, smile, laugh, blush, weep, sigh, groan. Nearly all our national proverbs are Anglo-Saxon. Almost all the terms and phrases by which we most energetically express anger, contempt, and indignation are of the same origin. What are known as the smart set, and so-called polite society, are relegating a great many of our old Anglo-Saxon words into the shade, faithful friends who served their ancestors well. These self-appointed arbiters of diction regard some of the Anglo-Saxon words as too coarse, too plebeian for their aesthetic tastes and refined ears, so they are eliminating them from their vocabulary and replacing them with mongrels of foreign birth and hybrids of unknown origin. For the ordinary people, however, the man in the street or in the field, the woman in the kitchen or in the factory, they are still tried and true and, like old friends, should be cherished and preferred to all strangers, no matter from what source the latter may spring. End of chapter 13 Read by Kara Schallenberg www.kray.org 
on November 10, 2006, in Oceanside, California. Chapter 14 The English Language This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. How to Speak and Write Correctly by Joseph Devlin Chapter 14 The English Language Beginning, Different Sources, The Present The English language is the tongue now current in England and her colonies throughout the world, and also throughout the greater part of the United States of America. It sprang from the German tongue spoken by the Teutons, who came over to Britain after the conquest of that country by the Romans. These Teutons comprised Angles, Saxons, Jutes, and several other tribes from the northern part of Germany. They spoke different dialects, but these became blended in the new country, and the composite tongue came to be known as the Anglo-Saxon, which has been the main basis for the language, as at present constituted, and is still the prevailing element. Therefore, those who are trying to do away with some of the purely Anglo-Saxon words, on the ground that they are not refined enough to express their aesthetic ideas, are undermining main props which are necessary for the support of some important parts in the edifice of the language. The Anglo-Saxon element supplies the essential parts of speech, the article, pronoun of all kinds, the preposition, the auxiliary verbs, the conjunctions, and the little particles which bind words into sentences, and form the joints, sinews, and ligaments of the language. It furnishes the most indispensable words of the vocabulary. Nowhere is the beauty of Anglo-Saxon better illustrated than in the Lord's Prayer. Fifty-four words are pure Saxon, and the remaining ones could easily be replaced by Saxon words. The Gospel of St. John is another illustration of the almost exclusive use of Anglo-Saxon words. Shakespeare, at his best, is Anglo-Saxon. Here is a quotation from the Merchant of Venice, and of the fifty-five words, fifty-two are Anglo-Saxon, the remaining three French. All that glitters is not gold. Often have you heard that told? Many a man his life hath sold, but my outside to behold. Gilded tombs do worms enfold. Had you been as wise as bold, young in limbs, in judgment old, your answer had not been enscrolled. Fare you well, your suit is cold. The lines put into the mouth of Hamlet's father in fierce intenseness, second only to Dante's inscription on the gate of hell, have one hundred and eight Anglo-Saxon and but fifteen Latin words. The second constituent element of present English is Latin, which comprises those words derived directly from the old Roman and those which came indirectly through the French. The former were introduced by the Roman Christians, who came to England at the close of the 6th century under Augustine, and relate chiefly to ecclesiastical affairs, such as saint from sanctus, religion from religio, chalice from calix, mass from misa, etc. Some of them had origin in Greek, as priest from presbyter, which in turn was a direct derivative from the Greek presbuteros, also deacon from the Greek diakonos. The largest class of Latin words are those which came through the Norman French, or Romance. The Normans had adopted, with the Christian religion, the language, laws, and arts of the Romanized Gauls and Romanized Franks, and, after a residence of more than a century in France, they successfully invaded England in 1066, under William the Conqueror, and a new era began. The French Latinisms can be distinguished by the spelling. Thus, Saviour comes from the Latin Salvator, through the French Sauveur. 
judgment from the Latin judiclum, through the French jugement, people from the Latin populace, through the French peuple, etc. For a long time the Saxon and Norman tongues refused to coalesce, and were like two distinct currents flowing in different directions. Norman was spoken by the lords and barons in their feudal castles, in Parliament and in the courts of justice, Saxon by the people in their rural homes, fields, and workshops. For more than three hundred years the streams flowed apart, but finally they blended, taking in the Celtic and Danish elements, and as a result came the English language with its simple system of grammatical inflection and its rich vocabulary. The father of English prose is generally regarded as Wycliffe, who translated the Bible in 1380, while the paternal laurels in the secular poetical field are twined around the brows of Chaucer. Besides the Germanic and Romanic, which constitute the greater part of the English language, many other tongues have furnished their quota. Of these the Celtic is perhaps the oldest. The Britons at Caesar's invasion were a part of the Celtic family. The Celtic idiom is still spoken in two dialects, the Welsh in Wales, and the Gaelic in Ireland, and the Highlands of Scotland. The Celtic words in English are comparatively few. Cart, dock, wire, rail, rug, cradle, babe, groan, griddle, lad, lass, are some in most common use. The Danish element dates from the piratical invasions of the ninth and tenth centuries. It includes anger, awe, baffle, bang, bark, ball, blunder, boulder, box, club, crash, dairy, dazzle, fellow, gable, gain, ill, jam, kidnap, kill, kidney, kneel, limber, litter, dog, lull, lump, mast, mistake, nag, nasty, niggard, horse, plow, rug, rump, sail, scald, shriek, skin, skull, sledge, slay, tackle, tangle, tipple, trust, viking, window, wing, etc. From the Hebrew we have a large number of proper names from Adam and Eve down to John and Mary and such words as Messiah, Rabbi, Hallelujah, Cherub, Seraph, Hosanna, Manna, Satan, Sabbath, etc. Many technical terms and names of branches of learning come from the Greek. In fact, nearly all the terms of learning and art, from the alphabet to the highest peaks of metaphysics and theology, come directly from the Greek. Philosophy, logic, anthropology, psychology, aesthetics, grammar, rhetoric, history, philology, mathematics, arithmetic, astronomy, anatomy, geography, stenography, physiology, architecture, and hundreds more in similar domains. The subdivisions and ramifications of theology as exegesis, hermeneutics, apologetics, polemics, dogmatics, ethics, homiletics, etc. are all Greek. The Dutch have given us some modern sea terms, as sloop, schooner, yacht, and also a number of others, as boom, bush, boar, brandy, duck, reef, skate, wagon. The Dutch of Manhattan gave us boss, the name for employer or overseer, also cold slaw, cut cabbage and vinegar, and a number of geographical terms. Many of our most pleasing euphonic words, especially in the realm of music, have been given to us directly from the Italian. Of these are 
piano, violin, orchestra, canto, allegro, piazza, gazette, umbrella, gondola, bandit, etc. Spanish has furnished us with alligator, alpaca, bigot, cannibal, cargo, filibuster, freebooter, guano, hurricane, mosquito, negro, stampede, potato, tobacco, tomato, tariff, etc. From Arabic we have several mathematical, astronomical, medical, and chemical terms as alcohol, alcove, alembic, algebra, alkali, almanac, assassin, azure, cipher, elixir, harem, hijira, sofa, talisman, zenith, and zero. Bazaar, dervish, lilac, pagoda, caravan, scarlet, shawl, tartar, tiara, and peach have come to us from the Persian. Turban, tulip, divan, and firman are Turkish. Drosky, knout, ruble, step, ukazi are Russian. The Indians have helped us considerably, and the words they have given us are extremely euphonic, as exemplified in the names of many of our rivers and states, as Mississippi, Missouri, Minnehaha, Susquehanna, Monongahela, Niagara, Ohio, Massachusetts, Connecticut, Iowa, Nebraska, Dakota, etc. In addition to these proper names, we have from the Indians wigwam, squaw, hammock, tomahawk, canoe, moccasin, hominy, etc. There are many hybrid words in English, that is, words springing from two or more different languages. In fact, English has drawn from all sources, and it is daily adding to its already large family, and not alone is it adding to itself, but it is spreading all over the world, and promises to take in the entire human family beneath its folds ere long. It is the opinion of many that English, in a short time, will become the universal language. It is now being taught as a branch of the higher education in the best colleges and universities in Europe, and in all commercial cities in every land throughout the world. In Asia it follows the British sway, and the highways of commerce through the vast empire of East India, with its two hundred and fifty millions of heathen and Mohammedan inhabitants. It is largely used in the seaports of Japan and China, and the number of natives of these countries who are learning it is increasing every day. It is firmly established in South Africa, Liberia, Sierra Leone, and in many of the islands of the Indian and South Seas. It is the language of Australia, New Zealand, Tasmania, and Christian missionaries are introducing it into all the islands of Polynesia. It may be said to be the living commercial language of the North American continent, from Baffin's Bay to the Gulf of Mexico, and from the Atlantic to the Pacific, and it is spoken largely in many of the republics of South America. It is not limited by parallels of latitude or meridians of longitude. The two great English-speaking countries, England and the United States, are disseminating it north, south, east, and west over the entire world. End of chapter 14 Read by Dennis Sayers in Modesto, California for LibriVox, winter 2007is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. How to Speak and Write Correctly by Joseph Devlin Chapter 15 Masters and Masterpieces of Literature Great Authors, Classification, 
the world's best books. The Bible is the world's greatest book. Apart from its character as a work of divine revelation, it is the most perfect literature extant. Leaving out the Bible, the three greatest works are those of Homer, Dante, and Shakespeare. These are closely followed by the works of Virgil and Milton. Indispensable Books Homer, Dante, Cervantes, Shakespeare, and Goethe The best translation of Homer for the ordinary reader is by Chapman. Norton's translation of Dante and Taylor's translation of Goethe's Faust are recommended. A Good Library Besides the works mentioned, everyone should endeavor to have the following. Plutarch's Lives, Meditations of Marcus Aurelius, Chaucer, Imitation of Christ by Thomas Akempis, Holy Living and Holy Dying by Jeremy Taylor, Pilgrim's Progress, Macaulay's Essays, Bacon's Essays, Addison's Essays, Essays of Elia or Charles Lamb, Les Miserables by Hugo, Heroes and Hero Worship by Carlyle, Palgrave's Golden Treasury, Wordsworth, The Vicar of Wakefield, Adam Bede by George Eliot, Vanity Fair by Thackeray, Ivanhoe by Scott, On the Heights by Auerbach, Eugenie Grandet by Balzac, Scarlet Letter by Hawthorne, Emerson's Essays, Boswell's Life of Johnson, History of the English People by Green, Outlines of Universal History, The Origin of Species, Montaigne's Essays, Longfellow, Tennyson, Browning, Whittier, Ruskin, and Herbert Spencer. A good encyclopedia is very desirable, and a reliable dictionary indispensable. Masterpieces of American Literature The Scarlet Letter, Parkman's Histories, Motley's Dutch Republic, Grant's Memoirs, Franklin's Autobiography, Webster's Speeches, Lowell's Bigelow Papers, also his critical essays, Thoreau's Walden, Leaves of Grass by Whitman, Leatherstocking Tales by Cooper, Autocrat of the Breakfast Table, Ben-Hur, and Uncle Tom's Cabin. The Ten Greatest American Poets Bryant, Poe, Whittier, Longfellow, Lowell, Emerson, Whitman, Lanier, Aldrich, and Stoddard. The Ten Greatest English Poets Chaucer, Spencer, Shakespeare, Milton, Burns, Wordsworth, Keats, Shelley, Tennyson, and Browning. The Ten Greatest English Essayists Bacon, Addison, Steele, Macaulay, Lamb, Geoffrey, De Quincey, Carlyle, Thackeray, and Matthew Arnold. The Best Plays of Shakespeare In order of merit are Hamlet, King Lear, Othello, Antony and Cleopatra, Macbeth, The Merchant of Venice, Henry the Fourth, As You Like It, Winter's Tale, Romeo and Juliet, The Midsummer Night's Dream, Twelfth Night, and The Tempest. Only the Good If you are not able to procure a library of the great masterpieces, get at least a few. Read them carefully, intelligently and with a view to enlarging your own literary horizon. Remember, a good book cannot be read too often. One of a deteriorating influence should not be read at all. In literature, as in all things else, the good alone should prevail. End of chapter 15 End of How to Speak and Write Correctly by Joseph Devlin